Hello and welcome to the Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson. The Local Leaders Podcast provides a platform for successful business owners to share their stories, their experiences, their advice, and their ideas in order to help our listeners achieve more success in their business and in their lives. Get ready. Another great show is coming up. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson, and uh, we are super excited to have you here listening again today, so welcome to all our listeners, and uh, we are uh, thrilled to bring Josh Hedquist of Joey Meatballs out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, onto the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Joey. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and do this and talk about my story. Yeah, I am too, and I said welcome, Joey, and I meant welcome, Josh. It, it happens meatballs. all the time. But, People uh, walk yeah. up and they're like, are you Joey Meatballs? I'm like, you're goddamn right I am. Yeah, that's exactly <clears> right. Hey, it doesn't I'm matter. Own it. Call me Josh. Call me Joey. It don't matter. Yeah. Just eat a damn meatball. Yeah, give me your money. <laughs> call <laughs> well, me whatever uh, you want. Well, Josh, we're, we're thrilled to have you on today, man. You got a, you got a hell of a story. And um, <clears> I kind of want to open up just open up the show and um, you know just tell our listeners, get ready and hang on because uh, uh, Josh is wide open. And, um, you know, he's, he's moving quick. So you gotta, you gotta kind of be on point and be listening and be ready, but he's rocking and rolling in uh, Minneapolis. So tell us a little bit about your, your story, kind of how you got Joey Meatball started and, uh, and what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. So I've been in the industry for almost 26 years, uh, started as a dishwasher, worked my way up to a, a credible executive chef, um, and worked for the man for a long time. And it just like broke my heart. It was even hard for me to keep jobs because it was so hard for me to buy into the corporate world. I think it was my entrepreneurial spirit that would not allow me to stick around for too long, you know, a year or two tops. Um, I think once I hit a certain age, I felt competent or confident that I was able to pull something off on my own 22, trying to open a restaurant. I don't know, but you know, in my thirties, maybe so. I came up with an idea of fast casual. I saw full service restaurants uh, and the research I was doing were dropping by eight to 9% on an annual basis. And fast casual was the new hot thing. I mean, Bobby Flay's doing it. Uh, you know, you got um, uh, uh, Chipotle, the gold standard, where they're doing $4.4 .4 billion as a company with 2000 stores selling $7 burritos. Like it fascinated me. And I was like, their food sucks. I know how to cook better. Let me take a stab at this. Yeah. Um, and, and, and whatever what my passion was, you know, that's what I had to cook. I'm not a burrito guy. Um, I do love pizza, but, you know, fresh pasta was my thing. So I came up with this idea. Thank God a pandemic hit. I know no one else says that. It gave me enough time to apply myself in the right way. Uh, the pandemic slowed the world down. But for us grinders, uh, it gave us an opportunity. You know, the wolves get fat when the sheep are scared. And I just used it to really get an awesome business plan together, do numbers, and starting to practice pitching my idea to people. And it became a fast, casual, fresh pasta Italian joint. That's awesome, man. It, uh, it, it, you know, it didn't, well, like you said, things kind of slowed down and gave you the opportunity to really build up and, and practice. And when you talk about practicing your pitch, I mean, who were you, who were you pitching? Were you looking for funds? What? <laughs> yeah, what were you doing? Everybody. I mean, anyone I walked, uh, old friends, new friends, strangers, anybody in the media, um, people I knew that had money, people I knew that didn't have money, but maybe they knew someone that had money. My original idea was to have my own brick and mortar, and I was going to need $750,000 to do it. Uh, there's a concept called Smash Burger, and that's what they do. It's about seven fifty for a build out, and mine's similar in size and fashion. So I figured, yeah, three quarters of a million dollars. You know, that's just a you know a piss in the wind for all these billionaires out there. But you know, they don't want to give you your money. And what I realized is I had to change my business model. How am I going to do this independently? Uh, I've had some success here locally with some real estate and rental properties. I sold a house uh, after owning it for four years, and I made about three quarters of a million dollars over that four-year process with the sale. And I cashed in and I started my own thing. I became independent. I put $60,000 in a business bank account. I went and talked to some people. Uh, landlords were no longer in the driver's seat. You know, it was us with a concept. It was us that we're going to 
bring landlords uh, out of this storm of uh, dead retail spaces. So I was able to negotiate um, a 20% uh, rent deal off my sales and they were going to pay for the build out and all the equipment. I think I had to give them a $5,000 deposit and I didn't even end up (laughs) giving them that check. And so I walked in, I got my first restaurant for free. I was also able to negotiate some money from local purveyors. I told them, Hey, here's my uh, performa. And I plan on doing something like where I'm building six to eight of these in the next few years. Uh, I'll sign a personal contract with you. Give me some money to help get these things going. Uh, because we're a mission-based development team, uh, they oblige. They think that, you know, that's cool that we're out here. You know, we're a felony-friendly work environment and a recovery-friendly work environment. And we go into areas that aren't necessarily luxurious. You know, we go into blue-collar neighborhoods because that's who our people are that want to, you know, eat a $13 meal instead of a $28 meal. And all of a sudden, um, you know, I'm sitting in the in the black. I just opened up my first restaurant and I made twenty thousand dollars my first month. <laughs> I made twenty grand my first month and I didn't put in any money. Like like I wanted to pitch myself because that's like a fucking dream. You know what I'm saying? Like no one does that. And um that momentum. I mean, let me talk to you about something real quick. I spent three years talking to everybody and their mom about money. I had a guy that was going to give me a million dollars, but he wanted half my business for the rest of the time I own it. And he wasn't going to do anything but give me money. That was so hard to walk away from, but it was the right move. Um, I don't ever want to partner with somebody that doesn't bring something to the table to help my business grow. Um, Money runs out, but hard work doesn't or capability doesn't or a set of skills. They don't. They're always with that person. And you can usually use those to further your business more than money. I've seen so many people throw money down the drain on dumb things, you know, a hundred grand a year on marketing and, you know, not have any success. So if there's anything I could tell anybody, money isn't all, isn't money, isn't everything. It's really important starting a business, but it's about having a good team. Um, So for three years, I'm out here just pitching that. And and it was never going to happen. You know, I was never going to come up with $750,000, give up half my ownership, and to start off in the hole, like this deal that I made, I was able to start a restaurant and have zero debt. And when you're not worried about debt, you're looking at other things in front of you. How do I make my food better? How do I get my brand more recognized? How does this concept evolve? A lot of people are like, how do I pay the bills? That didn't enter my head for the first few months of owning my first restaurant. That's that's pretty amazing because that that is ninety I don't know ninety plus percent of the time that is uh, you know what what startup restaurant tours are, are having to focus on they're having to focus on um, you know paying bills and uh, and laying down deposits and um, you know just forking over money uh, hand over fist and uh, it takes a while to build that business up and get the revenue coming in to support it so uh, that that's awesome man and I like the fact that. You know, even though you spend a good amount of time out chasing money, which, you know, a ton of entrepreneurs have done uh, both non-successfully and successfully, um, you know, you ultimately decided, hey, I want to be in charge of my own destiny. I don't want to be locked in this debt. So let me rethink what I'm trying to do here. Maybe instead of a $750,000 building, um, maybe I could open up, you know, my, my concept in someone else's. And that's pretty much what you've gone out and done. Correct. And, you know, a, a, a great part about the first for, first few years pitching this, I learned a lot about my concept. You know, every time I pitched something, I was able to learn from myself and from the people I talked to that I was, you know, throwing this pitch at. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people would be like, hey, my fir- the first name of Joey Meatballs was Pomodoro. And Pomodoro means tomato in Italian. But people felt like if I called it Pomodoro, maybe it would sound too elevated. Yeah, and people didn't know what the word meant, and I argued with them that no one knows what a chipotle is, but it worked well. <laughs> but you know, those guys got lucky, and I'm not chipotle, right? Yeah. Uh, so, what I would say is, uh, if you got to cast a big net, um, you got to talk to a lot of people. You don't know it all, and when you're starting a not when you when you're doing a startup business, there's so much you need to learn, and having conversations with a hundred people 
I mean, I learned so much in three years of failure. Like I can't, there's no business school that would have taught me this stuff um, at all. I mean, I don't care who, who's got what uh, hanging on their wall as far as uh, uh, where they graduated from what university, like that experience, that real world experience is invaluable. Um, I was able to, uh, you know, people asked me a lot of questions and I didn't have answers to in the beginning. Yep. And so, so it was great to um, have these ideas thrown at me, feel like a dummy because I couldn't answer them and then go back, do the research and then have the answer for the next person I talked to. And uh, all of a sudden I had this razor sharp fucking business plan, this concept, like this was cutting through anything. Like no one could stump me. In fact, when I started pitching ideas to people, there was no questions. I had it all down. I had a PowerPoint presentation. It was nine pages. I went through that thing. I hit the clicker. I had a video of rock and roll music and I dropped F-bombs and I knew when I could do it and when I couldn't. Yeah. And I played the crowd and, and eventually um, I didn't do it for money. I did it to be able to talk about Joey Meatballs. And now I'm the face of Joey Meatballs. And now I can deliver this with like so much tenacity and confidence that when I walk into a room with a, a potential landlord, that deal's getting done every fucking time. Yeah, the uh, I, I can see that. I mean, you got the energy, you got the you got the razor sharp plan, as you said, and and you got success under your belt already very quickly. And just to to let our listeners know, when we talk about quick success, we're talking. You know, you mentioned twenty grand first month, first restaurant uh, in profit, and nothing out of pocket. Uh, six months later, he's got six of them, guys. <laughs> Got six locations, four up and running, two are uh, coming soon, I think within about the next month or so. Um, and, you know, essentially you're in, um, tell us about where you are. You know, what, what are the locations like? What kind of businesses are you in? Uh, give me a little, or give our audience a little flavor. The cool thing about my concept is it can fit anywhere. Um, whether it's a food hall or whether it's a, a mall or whether it's a, someone else's brick and mortar and I can just come in and take over the kitchen. Um, you know, I found this cool way of becoming almost like a licensee. So, um, you know, I have one in a mall. I actually have two restaurants in one mall. Uh, and that does really well because it's automatic foot traffic. Uh, and then we have two restaurants and two different um, uh, food halls or markets. And those are really popular right now in America. You see them all over. The country in every state, everybody's got one. And you get 250 square feet, pretty much. You get a little kitchen. And then uh, the market or the food hall does marketing or provides you foot traffic. And those usually aren't long-term. And I never expect to be in those long-term. But now I really like them because I'm able to do, you know, I've spent um, probably $120,000 over the last six months on six restaurants. I mean, that's unheard of. Um uh, we're not in debt. We don't owe anybody any money and we're making money still, you know, during this nasty third season of uh, COVID. Um, we have found that not having overhead and not being in debt and not spending a lot of money makes you adaptable. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the concepts I have, we don't have bartenders. We don't have, you know, a front of the house manager. We don't have servers. And so we can get real lean when we have to. You know, we can get down to having just a kitchen manager and a couple cooks and keeping the labor low enough to survive any kind of catastrophe. I really wanted to, you know, when when Joey Meatballs was kind of conceived as an idea, uh, COVID was relevant. And mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that, you know, because we were all we were all told the first wave of COVID, it was going to go back to normal. That was everybody saying, I can't wait till it goes back to normal. And now we're in this third variant. But I made sure that it was going to be housing market crash proof because I lived through that. It was going to be recession proof because I lived through that. And it was going to be COVID proof because I lived through that. And, and um, those are things now to take into account when you have a startup, like can they thrive in a, uh, an economic uh, a storm of whatever it's created, it, whether it's a, a fourth variant or because of the inflation and deflation of what's going on in America. Like we don't know what the next 10 years are going to bring us, right? And, and so you have to have something that everybody likes. And so what I found is like, you got to get in the middle of the road. Usually if you're too cheap, not everybody wants to be a part of that. If you have value, but you're affordable, um, everyone wants to be a part of that. So kids love it. Older people love it. Empty nesters love it. Families love it. 
And, you know, you got to find that kind of that sweet spot, which I think we found. Yeah, I think you, I think you did too. And just to, to clarify, I mean, we're talking primarily a, a takeout slash to go uh, <clears throat> concept, which is, is really the rage right now. And, um, you know, that, that has really been growing uh, excessively since COVID, um, you know, that, that whole QSR piece uh, with takeout delivery curbside, um, you know, low cost, the operational costs are lower. And you have the ability to to be adaptable, like you said, and flexible. And and you can pop this thing in in a small place. Uh, you got a lot of a, a very low overhead. So, you know, it's just a it's just a phenomenal concept to be able to to take out there and and bring to the market. So, you hit it on the head, brother. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm I haven't won yet, but I feel like we're doing really well. I appreciate the compliment. Um, there's still a lot of things we have to learn, though. I think as uh, when you're small, your buying power is limited. Um, uh, you know, you're not getting rebates. I've worked for big companies where the money that these huge juggernaut companies make are like rebates off of how much food they buy a year. So if you're buying $17 million worth of product a year, they might kick you back $450,000 mm -hmm. just as a rebate. <laughs> Could you imagine making half a million dollars just on a rebate? Yep. Like you're, you're, your stores wouldn't have to be that profitable for you to be a, a you know a millionaire yep. and 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 so we're trying to figure out where that gap is you know one to six is fun but very doable but now it's developing infrastructure to go from six to 30 and you know you need you need different roles you know you need someone that's maybe a a, a buyer you need a head controller you need uh training people that will travel around the country you know we want to do a thousand of these so um, uh, it's definitely in its infancy stage and, and, uh, trying to reinvent the wheel puts us in a unique position because there's not a lot of people to soundboard, you know, this idea off of. Usually when I tell people this idea, they're like, oh, it's really cool. I never heard of that. So I'm like, great. You know, they, they got no advice, yeah. uh, to what the next step is. And, you know, I don't know if we're ever going to go that route where you build your own brick and mortar. I got a buddy that did it. He spent a million dollars. I said, how long is that going to take you to pay that off? And he doesn't want to give me the answer because he knows it's really long. He's like, yeah, but I'm making this much money. I'm like, you are, but you still like, like debt responsibility is a big deal. Yeah. You know, if you got $5 million of debt you're responsible for, like, I don't, <laughs> you're signing personal guarantees for that. That's a ton of responsibility. Yeah. And again, yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a distraction. Yeah. Big, big uh, interest payments on that each month to, to keep those loans rocking and rolling and you, not you to know? Mention trying to pay them down so that you can uh, actually have a, have a good asset. But And it's a commitment. Know. You can't go anywhere. You know, like you got to make sure, I mean, if you want to run a good business and you don't want to like screw your credit up, you got to sit around and either sell that and have someone else acquire that debt or you got to pay it off. And that's a commitment that, that, you know, isn't necessarily bad. But for me, I'm signing two-year leases and I have zero debt. I mean, I can pick up and bounce if it's not the right deal for us. And I don't have to like kill myself trying to make a, a square peg fit into a, a round hole. Because a lot of people do that, whether it's, you know, the restaurant or any kind of retail or service industry, mm -hmm. you could, you could be in the wrong location. You got a 10-year lease and you got $2 million of debt. What are you going to do with that? You know, you're pretty limited. Yeah, very limited, and uh, you know, I could I could use another one of those f bombs right there as far as what you are, but <laughs> <laughs> you are uh, not not in a good spot, which is why so many people love this this concept. So tell me what you're thinking, uh, Josh. Are you thinking um, are you going to try to grow it all internally? Or are you thinking franchise in the future? What, what's in your head? Yeah, so I think the franchise, you, you definitely need infrastructure, you need commissary kitchens, you need delivery, um, you need to have a spec'd out recipe that's being made in bulk. And those things I uh, don't necessarily turn me off um, to franchise or either, either way, if you want to grow big, you're going to have to do that at some point in time. You know, I said I wanted a thousand stores and there's probably three ways I could do it. I could get to 30 and someone could buy me out. And they can get it to a thousand and I get my $12 million payout and 7% for the rest of my life or, um, or I can grow this thing, um, myself and start adding to the team. So I've, I've acquired a partner, um, you know, he's bought into the company, but he's an operator like I am. And he brings a set of skill. You know, the best thing I could ever tell anybody is figure out what you suck at and then go hire someone or team up with someone that's really good at that. 
And, you know, that's what I was able to find with my partner, Peter Stampone. He's the exact opposite of me in every way. He's a front of the house guy. Um, he's a little bit more of a worrier, which is good to have one of those on your team because I don't worry about anything. I'm a free bird and a visionary. So like I, I can jump off a cliff and not be scared. Yeah. And you need those guys that'll hold your feet to the ground a little bit. And, um, uh, and so I think I got to see how it comes, you know, if I can manage it and if it's still fun and I can still make money and I'm not killing myself to continue to build the, the company, then, you know, I'm just going to keep doing that. I don't ever want to give everything I got to it forever. You know, I tell myself I'm going to give it 10 solid years. By the time I'm 50, I got to figure out what, you know, what do I want? What's important to me? And, you know, having family and stuff like that, like, I don't mind sacrificing a little bit of time to have a legacy for my family for the rest of their life. Yeah. But I definitely don't want to be in a position where I'm 67 years old. I got 30 restaurants. That I hate my life. You know, like that's not the vision I have. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be filthy, fucking rich. I want to be so rich that I'm weird to other people. I want to be eccentrically rich. And I don't know what that <laughs> looks like yet, but I want to have so much goddamn money because I, I've worked really hard at it. And, and I, and I, it's a dream and a vision that I have. And excuse me, someone just tried to call it. It's a dream and a vision that I've always had. And I, and I want to help as many people as I possibly can in this world. And I know I can do more good with the more money I have. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's absolutely the truth. And so let me ask you this. One of the big questions or one of the big challenges facing the industry today, it's staffing. And I know that you've got a very limited <clears throat> need for staffing, but is that a is that a restriction? Do you see it as a, a challenge, you know, to your growth coming up? Uh, we'll see how it plays out. I think the short game, it does. I don't think the long game, it will. I don't think it can be sustainable. I think that people in our industry it's kind of like payback, right? All these cooks that didn't get paid Jack, now they can ask for more money and they're getting paid that. But paying a line cook $52,000 a year is not sustainable for any company. And if the house isn't healthy, you're not going to be healthy. And that's the way I look at every lease deal that I do. I look at people that have a building I put a Joey Meatballs in. I'm like, how do you make money? You know, How do you become financially stable? Because if they don't know how to do that, then Joey Meatballs won't thrive either. You know. And so that's kind of the, the way that I look at it. I got cooks that want 25 bucks an hour that equates to $52,000 a year. And I don't, you know, people can't do that. It's just, it, that's so much money. Being in the industry my whole life, I want to pay, you know, I've been part of that. You know, this is, this is a new thing for me. I was part of the generation that didn't really get paid a lot of money for a professional job. And that was frustrating. But, uh, you know, to, to kill the industry because of greed is not the answer or yeah. payback or vindiction, whatever it is, uh, you know, paying someone $20 an hour, $22 an hour, where you're looking at, you know, the, the high thirties and mid forties is more sustainable. Um, but I also think um, if you want to grow your business, you got to pay to play. And I would rather pay someone $22 an hour and have them stick around for two years because it's a, it's a job that they can sustain a life. And when I say a life, like they can go on vacation, they can save a little bit of money. They're not living paycheck to paycheck. Um, they're really committed because this job now allows them to live a life they want to live. When it's a paycheck to paycheck place and you don't give a shit, you got turnover. Yeah. And turnover is the flu of every business. It costs me so much money when I have turnover. All that money you just spent, you know, training that person goes out the window. And now you got to double down and pay double. Again, so it's almost like a quadruple loss in my eyes to train a new person. Um, so staffing has been challenging, but with the low overhead, and I think we're, we're also, you know, I sit on the, the board. I'm actually the chairman of board of directions, board of directors of a nonprofit called the Redemption Project, where we find meaningful employment for convicted felons for mentorship. There's 15 million people in America with a felony on their record or doing time in prison. If you could hire half those people, there'd be enough uh, sustainability for our economy as a country to grow for the next five years. Um, but no one wants to touch them because of the stigma. Yeah. And I find that being a felony friendly work environment, a recovery friendly work environment, people that are battling recovery in any form, uh, we welcome people no matter what. I don't care who you fuck, who you pray to, who you voted for. I'm looking for good people 
that are competent and want that job and are hungry for it. And I think because we've taken that direction, it has helped us quite a bit in being able to hire people. You know, we're not, sometimes these big companies are like, we e-verify, which means um, they're doing a quadruple background check on somebody for, uh, if they're from like a different country and they don't hire convicted felons. And, you know, like good luck with that. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? These big companies that need a million employees, you yeah. just like wiped out half the people that come and apply. Yeah. Um, where yeah. we we don't battle that, you know, like I don't know how many felons I got working for me because I don't ask. I, I just, you know, I, I interview the human being and I look at their resume and that determines whether or not they're gonna work for us. Yeah, yeah, that's that's you're exactly right. And it's uh, you know, the the, the big 15 corporations. million, 15 million Americans out there with a felony that no one wants to hire. Yeah, it is just mind boggling, you know, like, but you're starting to see a, a turn now in America. It's all over LinkedIn, like all these mission based development guys that are, are a nonprofits where they're trying to find a way to acclimate uh, these convicted felons to the working world, because right now we need it more than ever. Yes, we do. You're absolutely right. It's been that way for the last couple of years. And um, again, that's the Redemption Project. Um, for anybody that, that's listening and wants to check it out, what's the website for that? Is it redemptionproject.org, maybe? Uh, yeah, dot .com. Okay, dot .com. Um, we're on LinkedIn. We're on Instagram. Um, uh, you can always find me, and I can give people any kind of information. We're always looking for donations. We're always looking for small businesses that want to get involved. Joy Meatballs is going to be you know, the flagship of the food industry with the Redemption Project. Um, and, and we're trying to go nationwide with the Redemption Project. Right now, it's just in Minnesota. We're in every state prison. We're doing about 650 men a year going through our program. We're looking at about an 80, no, sorry, 98% success rate. Out of everyone that's been through our program, we've only had two recommit, which is crazy numbers. I got to tell you, like having almost no recidivism is an amazing feat in itself. And uh, it's just a powerful movement. You know, like I'm a patriot and I care about every American in this country. And I think every American deserves a second chance, you know, and, and, and to have these people walk around like they're not real human beings in our country is like, I don't know, it drives me nuts. I'm a three time convicted felon. So maybe that's why I have a big heart for them. You know, I, I didn't go to high school. I was a lost cause. I got in trouble as a youngster. And uh, so I, I felt that battle going up. But I'll tell you what, that gave me the drive and the, and the grind to uh, get to where I'm at today. But I don't want to get too much into that sob story. I'm not trying to jerk any tears out of anybody. Um, but I, I think when you ask that question, staffing, you know, what does that look like? It's still a challenge. Um, and I think right now we're at the peak of it. I think we're going to start seeing it kind of fall off because there are less jobs now when there was all these people trying to hire all these, all these cooks and there was less cooks than there were um, uh, jobs available. They were able to, you know, I want this much money. Yeah. Well, with this COVID, this third wave of COVID and mask mandates and, you know, depending upon where you live, now they have vaccine mandates where you have to show proof that's yep. hurting businesses. Yep. And unfortunately, uh, that's hurting businesses in a way that that uh, make the ones that can survive a little healthier. It kind of sucks. It's cannibalistic in a way, but it's a free market, man. You know, you got to figure out a way to make it work. My favorite scene of all time in Forrest Gump that it relates to business is when him and Lieutenant Dan, Lieutenant Dan didn't have any legs and, and Forrest Gump was slow and they're on this, the, they're on the shrimp boat and a hurricane hits and Lieutenant Dan is like, come get me motherfucker. Like, come kill me. Like take us out. And he, and, and you know, he wasn't scared and he weathered the storm and they came back from the storm and all the shrimping boats were uh, damaged and they were the only shrimping boat left and bubblegum shrimp. Uh, came about and became a millionaire. Yeah, I'm getting goosebumps telling you this story. Yeah, that's awesome. how it's that's awesome. how you got to be. Weather the fucking <clears throat> storm. Wait for everyone else to flood out. And if you can be strong and if you can just not quit, you will prevail and you'll be the one shrimping boat left, and you're gonna fucking kill it. Yep. Yeah, that's, you're exactly right. I love that part of the movie as well. The whole the whole movie's fantastic, but that is a great uh, inspiring moment. <laughs> who, would have, who would have thought I would have been using that to relate to business? You know, you know well, how old is that movie? Like twenty five years old. Uh, I watched it, it as a kid, but it's still relevant to me today because of that one scene. 
Yeah, and it pumps you up, and that's that's what matters. You know, you gotta you gotta stay pumped. You gotta be excited. You gotta you gotta be able to get up out of bed and and uh, rock and roll every day. So, <clears throat> whatever turns your motor, man, <clears throat> live it hard, live it strong, and uh, and keep it going. So, you know, this is this is uh, Josh Hedquist of Joey Meatballs for our listeners who who may have uh, missed out on that that first piece. I didn't mention the website for our listeners. Uh, it's joeymeatballs.org. Uh, so be sure to check it out. It's, um, uh, you know, they've got four locations up and running and with two coming uh, here in the near future. Uh, is everything in and around Minneapolis right now? I didn't ask you that. Yeah, everything's in and, and around Minneapolis uh, <laughs> and the surrounding suburbs. Uh, we, you know, we're looking to expand to other areas. We got the Mall of America, which is the largest mall in the country. They reached out to us recently. We got a lot of other opportunities. My really smart business partner, Peter Stampone, is telling me to pump the brakes a little bit. <laughs> Uh, because we're growing so fast and I'm getting after everything. And, you know, the one thing I'll tell you is like, when, when there's gold in the, them, our heels, you got to go get it and, uh, uh, and, and, and ask for a little bit of punishment at the same time. Yeah. Cause right, right now is every entrepreneurial dream. You know, it, it, things are just in a place to where you can get what you're looking for, uh, because of what's going on in the world. There's a lot of things that have slowed down. There's a lot of things that have stopped. There's a lot of scared people. They're scared to make decisions um, based off all that. And so if you can be one of those people, it's just a, a great place to be. So for me, I just want to keep you know, going after it. And, and then once we get to a certain point where we have to stop just you know, financially or you know, whatever it is, then you, 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 know, you kind of chill out and reorganize and look at what you got. But right now, I'm still picking up the gold pieces. And like you said, you got to get them while they're getting this good and um, go out there and, and pick them up. But I understand slowing down, pumping brakes, and, and making sure you got everything in place as well, because you can grow too quickly and kind of uh, outrun your capabilities. Um, you know, you got supply chain, you got training, you got um, consistency, right? Consistency of product. Yeah. You got to make sure that you got quality control in place. Um, and, and consistency, you know, it has to do a lot with the rest, uh, recipes and process and uh, all that takes time to build and, and get out there. And again, you're six months old, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's pretty weird, I'll tell you. Yeah. I never thought I'd be here, you know, like, uh, but I don't stop to think ever. I just keep going. I fall forward all the time. I never look behind me. If I fail, I fail forward. Um, uh, it's it's uh, something that is in me uh, intuitively. I don't, no one taught me that. And it, it sucked when I was younger because I didn't um, learn enough from my mistakes. But now that I'm a little bit older and wiser, I make better decisions. You know, I never look back. I just keep looking forward. I never even stop to smell the roses. A lot of people are like, wow, look what you've done. And I'm like, I can't wait till I get to be somebody. And everyone's like, oh, you are some. I think that's just the way I feel. You know, you got to stay hungry. It's that it's that Tom Brady, right? Yep. That guy's got everything. Everything. I mean, talk about having it all. Like, what does that guy not have, right? Yep. Besides bad luck, he's got everything. And um, but he stays hungry and he's got a chip on his shoulder and he's always kind of pissed off a little bit. And um, or not or not happy or got something to prove. And if you can tap into that, I mean it it'll it'll go far. I think a lot of people in my position might have been happy with like the two restaurants and they didn't spend any money and they made, you know, I didn't even I haven't even cashed out. I pay myself a meager fifty two thousand dollars a year. And every dime I make, I put back into the company. I could be driving a Ferrari right now or whatever I want, but instead I'd rather reinvest because I got more to prove and I'm not, I'm not there yet. And, and I don't think I'll ever be there or have arrived. Because once, you, you know, once you're content, you know, you're dead. You yeah. know, like once people feel comfortable, that's it. You know, once you, once you feel like you don't have to work hard anymore, like that's a scary place to be. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, again, growing, you're dying. And, um, you know, we, we want to reach a lot of those people. And, and our goal with the podcast is to, um, to uh, provide motivation, inspiration, uh, advice, ideas, all those types of things um, to entrepreneurs, uh, especially of, of food and beverage businesses, um, to be able to go out there and grow or scale up their, their operations. So many people, are, you know, get so bogged down in the, the day-to-day operations of running the business that that they fail to to take advantage and, and try to blow it out and expand it. And that's what we're all about with this podcast is trying to help our listeners um, to be able to expand it. And, and hearing your story is very inspirational. 
Um, you've, you've done a lot uh, with very little in a short period of time. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see, you know, next year at this time where you are and, and two or three years down the road. Um, and I don't have any doubt that a thousand use, units uh, will not come. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, um, it, I'm, I'm hoping so. I'm hoping you're right. You, you know, it might not be tomorrow. Uh, it's going to take you a little time, like you said, with yeah. building up the infrastructure and, and getting things in place. And the company's going to have to continue to grow and, and evolve. And as you said, you also don't ever know what the environmental or external factors are going to be with regulations and government and pandemics and um, um, you know interest rates and everything else that's going on. So, um, the products. But, yeah. I mean, uh, that's a huge thing that a lot of people don't know about right now is uh, arugula costs $9 a pound. Yeah. Arugula, yeah. the stuff that grows out of the ground and green, that stuff is damn near dandelion greens, is $9 a pound, and you can't get it all the time. Uh, that's probably the biggest challenge in the food industry right now is getting product and the inflation. I mean, I'm lucky because I don't buy steak. I don't buy scallops. I'm not buying salmon. I'm not buying these things that are a lot more expensive, uh, except for wings. We are buying wings. Wings right now quadrupled in price mm. because they can't find anybody to work these these plants that that pack the wings. But yeah. um, that's a that's a big challenge. That's again, that's a you know whether the storm type thing, it eventually you know there'll will there'll be some depreciation in the product, um, and we'll get back to. I mean, we'll be even more profitable by then, which I'm kind of excited. <laughs> You know, when like the, the staffing, you know, the, the price of staffing comes down, the price of goods come down, it's more consistent. Yeah. We actually might start making some, you know, real money. But uh, that, that was one thing I never took in consideration when I was developing my Performa. You know, you always have like a sliding scale, right? Like every every year, maybe inflation by three to 5% by product. Yeah. But you, ne you never thought 150%. That was, that was something that we did not expect. We were able to navigate, but man, that was tough. Yeah, absolutely. And and who knows, you know, you may have to, a lot, a lot of folks have, have gotten around some of those challenges by, you know, re-engineering their menu, bringing in new items, taking out old items. Um, buying and, local. That's what helped us the most, buying local. Yeah. You don't see the, you don't see the inflation with the small guys. You know, the, um, they're able to sustain their business a lot in a, in a lot more of a regular fashion. And, um, uh, you know, their, their prices went up, but way more affordable. And when you have a good relationship with somebody that's local, they care about you. They want to see you do good. You're not just a number on a spreadsheet. And so they do what they can to help you and your business grow. Mm. Buying local was like one of the things that saved me. I have beef farmers, pork farmers, dairy farmers, uh, and then some local like actual green farmers that, that sell like uh, uh, vegetables and things of that nature that helped us uh, over the last six months. As is your menu, I didn't ask you before, but and and I know we're kind of getting getting close to the to the timing. But is your menu uh, super expansive, or is it pretty limited? Uh, give us give our, our listeners a flavor of kind of what the menu looks like. Yeah, all our menus are hyper focused. You know, we have four concepts right now. Joy Meatballs is the big one. We have a couple other one off concepts, but it's all hyper focused stuff. So we do fresh pasta. We have uh, five different pastas with five different sauces, five different proteins, and a couple different cheeses. You can build your own, and there's probably 800 different variations if you build your own. And then we have six to seven, like Joey's favorites, where they're already composed. You can walk up and be like, I want that one. You know, we got one called the baller. It's two giant meatballs. We got cheese ravioli, shrimp scampi. But, you know, it's having a big inventory and a big menu is just, you never want to do that. You know, like you, you just always want super low inventory. I don't even count my inventory. We don't have enough to count. Like why I'm not going to count 400 bucks. You know, it doesn't swing my cost that much um, because I just buy a lot of flour and everything that I buy goes into production immediately and keeping a hyper focus really allows you to manage it. When you get to those menus that have, you know, 35, 45 menu items that are composed and each dish has nine to 10 ingredients in it, that is, that's a job in itself. You know, it's one of the ways that we're able to keep things really lean with staffing is by having it hyper focused. So if you're going to do fried chicken, just do fried chicken. You know, if you're going to do sandwiches, just do sandwiches. If you're going to do pasta, just do pasta. If you're going to do pizza, just do pizza. And we've seen that work for all the big companies. Subway, you know, they make sandwiches. Look at them. Yeah. <clears throat> they try to, do you remember when they tried to do pizzas? 
I do remember that. Yeah, that was probably January. 10 years ago. Yep. Or look maybe, at maybe look a little at, less. Look at McDonald's. They try to do salad shakers and they try to do this. They try to do that. It didn't work. You know, stay hyper-focused. Learn from the gold, the, the gold standard. You know, McDonald's has 28,000 stores. People say McDonald's food sucks. I don't fucking care. 28,000 stores. Look at what they've done they, and what their concept has done and how they've stayed successful and relevant my whole entire life. Yeah, you got that right. Yeah, I saw a commercial last night. I was talking with my wife. It was, um, <clears throat> what was it? It wasn't Chick-fil-A. It was Wendy's. It's gone to breakfast. You know, they've got breakfast menu now. Uh, it just Good doesn't luck. feel right. <laughs> it doesn't feel right. You're right. And they're trying to jump on a bandwagon. And we don't identify bandwagons, I think. Um, but there's something subconsciously that we don't like about it. Like, I'd never go to Taco Bell for breakfast. I yeah. never would. It's never been that place for me. I don't know if you got Taco Bells where you're at. We but, do. Yeah, we do. Um, uh, McDonald's has always been the breakfast joint. And, you know, they're lucky that they got on that. I think anyone that's tried to do breakfast since has not really seen a huge return. You know, like you just got to do what you do well and, oh. and focus on that. You know who Gary V is? I don't, but I'll check. Gary V. Yeah, he's a, a brilliant son of a bitch. And he says, don't always worry about what you suck at. Double down on what you're good at if you want to grow. And I, I kind of like that. I do worry about what I'm not good at, but I don't put all my time and energy in fixing what I'm not good at. I double down on what I'm great at. And and I seem to experience a little bit of success because of that. Everyone's so focused on what they're not good at. If you make really good burgers, just make really good fucking burgers. Just put all your time and energy into what people like about you. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, great advice and, uh, you know, probably a, a great piece of advice to, to start to wrap up the podcast on because, um, as you said, you know, focus is the key. Hyper focus is, is kind of the trend. Um, you know, it's been a trend on and off throughout the years. And uh, right now, it's, you know, it's back again and certainly where we're seeing the most success. Uh, quick serve concepts, delivery, takeout, curbside, uh, online ordering, uh, all those things. Um, you guys with Joey Meatballs have, have come up with a, a fantastic concept. Uh, it's very deliverable to the market. And, um, you know, we're looking forward again to you building this thing out and, and really blowing it up if, uh, if your partner doesn't pump the brakes too hard on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, hopefully there'll be one out there by you soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man, because we, uh, we're not too far away. Again, uh, Joey Meatballs out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we've got Josh Hedquist on with us today, who's uh, who's been just lighting us up with energy and enthusiasm and uh, excitement and some really good words of advice. So I encourage all our listeners to hit playback and, and run this thing again. Take notes um, as you're thinking about bringing, especially those entrepreneurs out there in our listening audience who are thinking of, of bringing a new concept to market. Uh, think long and hard you know, about what you do between full service and, and some of these um, lower operational cost and, and, and anybody can hit me up if anyone has any ideas and they have questions i mean i can get more granular on where i how i got to where i was at you know this is all started off a five five thousand dollar investment off some real estate property but um i'm always uh i'm an open book i don't have any secrets uh you know everything i did is uh is out there for people to use to chase their own dreams Absolutely. And, and chasing dreams is, uh, and, and watching them or living them come into reality is. That is what I'm talking about. Live that dream, baby. Yep. Yep. Live it, baby. And rock and roll it and uh, do what you're good at and stay focused. And again, uh, Josh, thank you so much for being on here thank today. You. Our listeners enjoyed uh, getting to know you, getting to know Joey Meatballs a bit. Uh, yeah. JoeyMeatballs.org. Go check them out. Place an order if you're in the area. Uh, eat some uh, eat some great food and uh, be sure to share it with your friends. So thank you, Josh, for being Thanks, here. Thanks, brother. Talk and thank to you, you soon. Hey, man, thank you. And thank you to our listeners for being here today for another episode of Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson, and we'll catch you on the next round.